The Emperor's New Holy Armor An Adaptation of The Emperor's New Suit by Hans Christian Andersen, 1837 Many, many years ago there lived an emperor who thought so much of his religion that he spent all his time learning new ways to strengthen his faith. His only ambition was to serve the gods. He did not care for his soldiers, and the theater did not amuse him. In fact, the only thing he thought of was to display his piety and win over new converts. He prayed every hour of the day, and as one would say of a king, he is in his cabinet. So one could say of him, the emperor is in his sanctuary. The great city where he resided was very happy. Every day strangers from all parts of the globe arrived. One day, two swindlers came to this city. They made people believe they were blacksmiths and declared they could manufacture the finest holy armor to be imagined an armor with the divine properties of repelling even the most wicked of demonic forces. Their colors and patterns, they said, were not only exceptionally beautiful, but armor made of their materials possessed the quality of being invisible to any man who was unable or unwilling to believe in the glory of the gods. Those must be wonderful metals, thought the emperor. If I were to be dressed in a suit of armor made of this material, I should be able to find out which men in my empire are heathens and non-believers, and I could distinguish the clever from the stupid. I must have this armor crafted for me without delay. And he gave a large sum of money to the swindlers in advance that they should set to work without any loss of time. They set up two forges and pretended to be very hard at work, but they did nothing whatsoever on the blacksmith tables. They asked for the finest alloys and the most precious gold and gems for the inlays and settings. All they got, they kept, and worked at the bare anvils till late at night. I should very much like to know how they're getting on with the armor, thought the emperor. But he felt rather uneasy when he realized that he was perhaps not fit for his service to the gods and might not be able to see it. Personally, he was of the opinion that he had nothing to fear, yet he thought it advisable to send somebody else first to see how matters stood. Everybody in the town knew what remarkable qualities the male possessed, and all were anxious to see how faithless or stupid their neighbors were. I shall send my honest old minister to the smiths. He can judge best how the metals look, for he's intelligent, and nobody understands his office better than he. The good old minister went into the hall where the swindlers sat before the empty anvils. Heaven preserve us, he thought, and opened his eyes wide. I cannot see anything at all. But he did not say so. Both swindlers requested him to come near and ask him if he did not admire the exquisite pattern, pointing to the empty workbench. The poor old minister tried his very best, but he could see nothing, for there was nothing to be seen. Oh dear, he thought, can I be so blind? I should never have thought so, and nobody must know it. Is it possible that my occasional doubts have made me unfit for my position? No, no, I cannot say that I was unable to see the armor. Now, have you got nothing to say? asked one of the swindlers while he pretended to be busily hammering. Oh, it is very pretty, exceedingly beautiful, replied the old minister, looking through his glasses. What beautiful patterns, what exceptional craftsmanship. I shall tell the emperor that I like the holy plate mail very much. We are very pleased to hear that, said the two blacksmiths, and described to him the colors and explained the curious engravings. The old minister listened attentively, that he might relate to the emperor what they said, and so he did. Now the swindlers asked for more money, gems and gold, which they required for forging. They kept everything for themselves 
and not a single ruby came near the non-existent settings, but they continued, as hitherto, to work at the barren forges. Soon afterwards, the emperor sent his honest monk to the blacksmiths to see how they were getting on, and if the armor was nearly finished. Like the old minister, he looked and looked, but could see nothing, as there was nothing to be seen. Is it not a beautiful set of mail? asked the two swindlers, showing and explaining the magnificent patterns which, however, did not exist. I am not a stupid atheist, thought the monk. It is therefore my good appointment for which I am not fit. It is very strange, but I must not let anyone know it, for my very livelihood would be in jeopardy. And the monk praised the armor which he did not see, and expressed his joy at the beautiful colors and shiny metalwork. It is excellent, he said to the emperor. Everybody in the whole town talked about the sacred armor. At last, the emperor wished to see it himself while it was still on the rack. With a number of his clergymen, he went to the two clever swindlers, who now worked as hard as they could without using any steel or gold. Is it not magnificent? asked the monk and the old minister. Your majesty must admire the colors and the patterns. And they pointed to the empty armor rack. For they imagined the emperor and the other holy men could see the masterpiece. What is this? thought the emperor. I do not see anything at all. That is terrible. Am I not devout enough? Am I unfit to be king of this holy empire? Really, he said, turning to the blacksmiths, your mail has our most gracious approval. And nodding contentedly, he looked at the empty rack, for he did not like to say he saw nothing. All the clergymen who were with him looked and looked, and although they could not see anything more than the others, they said, like the emperor, it is very beautiful. They all advised the emperor to wear the new magnificent armor at a great procession which was soon to take place. It is magnificent, beautiful, excellent, one heard him say. Everybody seemed to be delighted, and the emperor appointed the two swindlers imperial court blacksmiths. The whole night before the procession was to take place, the swindlers pretended to work so the townspeople would see they were busy to finish the emperor's new suit of armor. They pretended to take the panoply from the anvil, fitted the accompanying cloak, and polished the invisible carapace with cloths. At last, they announced, the emperor's new armor is ready now. The emperor and all his holy advisors then came to the hall. The swindlers held up their arms as if they had something in their hands and said, These are the leg pieces, this is the breastplate, and here is the cloak, and so on. They are all light as a cobweb, and one must feel as if one had nothing at all upon the body, but that is just its divine properties. Indeed, said the priests and shamans, but they could not see anything for there was nothing to be seen. Does it please your majesty now to graciously undress, asked the swindlers, that we may assist your majesty in putting on a new suit of mail before the large looking glass? The emperor undressed, and the swindlers pretended to strap the shiny pieces to him, one after another, and the emperor looked at himself in the glass from every side. How well they look, how well they fit, exclaimed all the clergymen. What a beautiful pattern, what fine colors. This is truly a magnificent and holy artifact. The master of ceremonies announced that the bearers of the canopy, which was to be carried in the procession, were ready. I am ready, said the emperor. Does not my armor fit me marvelously? Then he turned once more to the looking glass, that people should think he admired his mail. The chamberlains, who were to carry the train of the accompanying cloak, stretched their hands to the ground as if they lifted up a train, 
and pretended to hold something in their hands. They did not like people to know that they must be unbelievers. The emperor marched in the procession under the beautiful canopy, and all who saw him in the street and out of the windows exclaimed, Indeed, the emperor's new defense against demons is incomparable. What a long train he has, how well it fits him. Nobody wished to let others know. He saw nothing, for then he would be labeled a heretic. Never were the emperor's vestments more admired. But he has nothing on at all, said a little child at last. Good heavens, listen to the voice of an innocent child, said the father. The townsfolk began whispering to each other what the child had said. But he has nothing on at all, cried at last the entire crowd. That made a deep impression on the emperor, for it seemed to him that they were right. But he thought to himself, now I must bear up to the end, and the priests, and the chaplains, and the shaman, and the monks, and the ministers walked with still greater dignity, as if they saw the armor, which did not exist. <laughs>